So, Amos, are you there? Go ahead. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Amos. How are you? Yes, yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Are you ready to give us your? Yes, oh, yes, I'm ready. Okay, Thank go on. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate you for the opportunity to give this um, um, presentation. I'm so grateful. Um, let me try to share my slide. Um, can any, everybody see my slide now? Yes, we can. Yes. Once again, I thank Dros Africa and the entire team of Dros Africa, um, especially Dr. Isabel, Dr. Mata, Dr. Bermundo Lola, for the opportunity to give this talk, um, which is basically on um, Drosophila as, a, as an adaptable model organism for the study of chemically induced diseases. Um, when we started, we did not have access to genetically modified flies. And even apart from that, um, our core area of our specialization is toxicology. Um, and um, we use different models to study the um, mechanism of toxicity of different chemicals. In this lecture, I'm going to go through this brief outline. First of all, I will share our research interest at the Zosophila Lab, University of Ibadan. Then I will also um, select some chemically induced diseases that we are studied and some that we are still studying. I've also been asked to share a bit of the Dosophila Training Initiative in Nigeria. So I'll just give a brief update from 2014 to 2021, because it was in 2014 that I commenced Dosophila research in Nigeria after a postdoctoral training um, in Brazil for one year. So this is our um, university, University of Ibadan. This is University of Ibadan. This is my department, Department of Biochemistry. And this is our laboratory, the Sofila Lab University of um, Ibadan. Um, basically, in the Sofila Laboratory, University of Ibadan, we are interested um, in the mechanism by which certain chemicals contribute to the pathogenesis of different diseases, particularly looking at um, Parkinson disease, cancer, diabetes, and also, we are also interested in um, whatever we can use that is abundant in our plants, the phytochemicals, to design concept for the prevention, as well as um, a possible therapy of the diseases induced by these chemicals. And lately, we have also started working with genetically, um, genetic models of um, Parkinson disease and then um, cancer. In, uh, in our research laboratory, we actually assay for different markers. For example, markers of oxidative stress and also antioxidant markers. These markers are not routinely carried out in the, labo in the hospital, but um, looking at these oxidative stress markers, it will be easy to be able to know um, how the organism um, can develop different diseases. And then the antioxidant system in the body, like the superoxide, dismutase, GST, catalase, and other antioxidant enzymes, as well as non-antioxidant, um, non-enzymatic antioxidant like the um, glutathione and non-potent thiols, all these help to ensure that the system is well protected. However, when these are overwhelmed, it can lead to different diseases. And we study this in our laboratory. We also look at this at the genetic level, molecular level to look at gene expression. And then gradually also, uh, we are starting with respect to Western blotting technique. We just have one more equipment to go to start operating this fully. So um, chemicals can actually be um, organ specific. Um, they can be specific to certain organs, and then they can also cause, um, some can cause carcinogenesis, neurogenetic diseases, reproductive dysfunction. Apart from that also, um, some chemicals, if a pregnant woman is exposed to certain chemicals, they can induce teratogenesis, which is actually malformation in the unborn child. 
So the adverse effects of chemicals in the environment cannot be overemphasized. There are different model organisms that um, are being used to study toxicology. For example, the fish that Dr. Isabel mentioned, the rats, um, cell lines, cell organs, white blood cells. These are different, different models that are used to uh, study uh, toxicology. But uh, what we use currently in our laboratory is actually the and gaster. Um, just like Dr. Isabel, I didn't start with the and gaster. I started with, um, I've worked with rabbits, I've worked with rats um, throughout my studies. But it was during the postdoctoral training that I was introduced to the and gaster. And since that time, I've not um, regretted working with the fly. These are some of the chemicals that we have looked at. I would like to group the chemicals under reproductive toxicants. And these are toxicants that can induce reproductive dysfunction in animal models. I am particularly interested in the chemical that can induce reproductive dysfunction in the female um, animal. And then we also have some chemicals that can actually cause cancer, for example, sodium arsenide, which is a um, class one carcinogen. We also have neurogenerated diseases, for example, copper, aluminum, rotinol, MPTP. These have been reported to induce different neurogenerated diseases. It's also possible to induce diabetes using high sucrose diet. Several people might be asking that um, how is it possible to do, to carry out studies with respect to these diseases using chemical, this is part of what I'm going to share in this study, in this presentation. So what we do basically is to expose the fly to the chemical that is already mixed with the diet of the, of the fly. And then after the period of treatment, we homogenize in appropriate buffer. There are different buffer system and different solvent that you can use to homogenize depending on the assay of interest. And then we centrifuge at appropriate speed and temperature. And then you evaluate, you remove the supernatant and use that as um, the sample that you can now use to assay um, for what you want to carry out. There are different biomarkers in toxicology depending on what is of interest to you. For example, if you, if you are interested in markers of adaptive responses, these are some of, of the markers that you can, you can check. If you are interested in apoptosis, these are some of the markers that you can, so there are several markers in toxicology that you can work with. Let me start with chemical-induced uh, model of uh, reproductive dysfunction. And in this, I would like to start with 4-venous cyclohexene and its metabolites. 4-venous cyclohexene is a chemical that has been established to accelerate the rates of depletion of the follicles. You know, the female have, they have finite number of um, eggs, and then once this is depleted, it will lead to um, menopause. So these are some of the chemicals that are specific to the ovary and accelerates the rate of depletion of this ovary. This is just an apothetical um, figure that is showing us what happens to um, a normal person that is not exposed to these ovotoxic agents. Um, the person might reach menopause at the age of maybe between 49 and 50 plus. But if that process has been accelerated as a result of exposure to some of these ovotoxic agents, it can lead to um, attaining menopause at a later period. So that was part of the interest in this particular chemical to be able to understand the mechanism by which this chemical induce this um, toxicity. And if we understand the mechanism, it will be easy to know what to do if somebody is exposed to this chemical to minimize the toxic effect. And um, the parent compound was actually uh, we carried out the study and we published this in free radical biology and medicine. I have put this here and I've also put several other papers that we have published um, for anyone who is interested to be able to easily assess them. And we found that the parent compound actually led to accumulation of reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. And these RONs are on a physiological situation. They are good in the system, in reproduction, in signaling, but over accumulation, 
as a result of exposure to chemicals can be deleterious. And that was what we found with respect to the parent compound. In addition to that, we also found that some genes were actually misregulated, like the SOD1 and catalyst, as example. Then we move to the metabolites of the parent compound. This metabolite had uh, the four vinylcyclazine monoepoxide and the four vinylcyclazine diepoxide, and we expose different set of flies, different concentration from 10 micromolar to 10 millimolar, and then we carried out survival study. After the survival study, we selected these doses for the two metabolites, and then we now treated for five days and look at um, some toxicological markers. And then we found that um, these genes like CYP 18A1, JAFRAC1, as well as um, the um, tyrosine reductase were actually um, misregulated compared with the control. Then apart from that, we also found that the enzyme referred to as the data amino levulinate diadatase that is involved in heme synthesis was also inhibited. And then there are two mechanisms by which this enzyme can be inhibited. The first is that if there is leg or any matter that can attack the enzyme the and, displace, and displace zinc, it can inhibit the enzyme. And there is, since there is no lead in our, in our assay me, uh, me, medium, um, the other um, mechanism by which the enzyme can be inhibited is if there is any electrophilic species in the system of free radical that can attack any of these tiles, and then it will lead to structural change that will not affect the activity on the enzyme. So that was how we uh, were able to understand one of the mechanisms of toxicity of this parent compound as well as the metabolite um, that is actually responsible for the overtoxicity recorded in mammals. And then we published this in Redox Biology, the two metabolites together. I will not, that is where after, these are these papers that I published when I was um, under the training with Professor Rocha in Brazil. When I returned to Nigeria, before I finally um, decided to uh, work with fly, I exposed rats, female rats to the same compound, the three compounds, the, the parent compound as well as the metabolite. And then we removed the ovaries and the uterus, and we were amazed to find that the same conclusion were actually recorded. And that was what eventually made me to work with the fly since 2014. And then trichloroethylene is another chemical that is also toxic to the ovary. And then we published this in Environmental Toxicology and Pharmacology. Because of time, I will not go into the details of all the findings in all the papers, but I will just summarize what happened. Um, and we found that the trichloroethylene induced oxidative damage in the fly. And then we use esperidine, which is a citro biflonol that is um, good an antioxidative agent. And it was able to ameliorate the toxic effect of trichloroethylene. As ethylene. Uh, in addition to that, um, we also carried out different study to find out how we can induce diabetes if you do not have access to genetically modified fly for diabetes. High sucrose diet has been established to actually um, induce oxidative stress that play a critical role in the pathogenesis of diabetes and its complications. As a matter of fact, Dr. Kagan um, um, in 2011 um, published this paper using high sugar diets, um, exposing fly to high sugar diets, and they found out that that caused hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, as well as elevated fatty acids. And this was published in um, Disease Models and um, Mechanism. It's a good paper that I will encourage you to, um, to check. We also have um, a study that we have carried out in our laboratory that is currently under second review in food and chemical toxicology. But for the, in this slide, I just showed you um, unexposed fly, as well as flies exposed to different doses of the, of the sucrose, 15 to 30% of the diet. 
and then we found that the sucrose the glucose level was elevated non-protein tires were reduced and then catalyst activity was also um, inhibited and these are some of the reasons that um, the high sucrose diet can actually induce uh, diabetes we also have chemical induced model of neurogenetic diseases there are different diseases neurogenetic diseases that can actually um, be developed as a result of exposure to this chemical one is one methyl four phenyl one two three c theta hydroperidine um, the short form um, is just mptp this mptp um, is metabolized by monoamine oxidase b to mpp plus it is this mpp plus that will eventually attack dopaminergic neurons and block electron transport chain and then that will lead to the death of these neurons and then dopamine level will be reduced and that's one of the hallmark of the Parkinson disease and we exposed flies to different doses of this MPTP and we found that the survival of the flies reduced as a result of exposure and then we also um, use resveratrol this is the chemical structure of resveratrol which is abundant in grapes and then we found that resveratrol actually extended the lifespan of the flies compared with the control. And then we published this in biochemical and biophysical research communication. And this was the paper that we used as preliminary data to apply for the AGEP grant that we got. This is the third year now. We just talk a bit about it at the, uh, close to the end of this presentation. Apart from MPTP, we also have rotinone. Rotinone is also a model that is used to induce neuro degenerative diseases in animal and then we have exposed flies to this and we use Garcinia cola to ameliorate the toxic effect actually we are interested in whatever is abundant in africa medicinal plants like the phytochemicals and we make use of the pure compound of this phytochemical to see if this can be used to um, ameliorate some of the um, toxic implication of exposure to these toxicants so i just put here some um, of the data that we have in the laboratory with respect to exposure to 250 and 500 micromolar rotinone. And then if you look at the survivor compared with the untreated fly, you see reduction in survivor. And then with respect to the non-protein tires, you know, we have several tires that are not part of protein. And then we refer to them as uh, non-protein tires, like beta tion, for example. And we also have total tires these two tires were actually reduced as a result of exposure to rotinone. Catalyst activity was also inhibited as well as GSC activity. NO, which is nitric oxide, um, was elevated as a result of exposure to this rotinone together with hydrogen peroxide. So all these markers can be used to predict the disease state of the organism. And then apart from rotinone, we also have carried out studies with respect to using aluminum chloride to induce neurotoxicity. And then we found that aluminum actually induces oxidative stress and also reduce the survival of the flies. We published this in Journal of Functional Foods. I have put this here so that you will be able to have access to these papers after now. We have also carried out studies with copper. You can also use copper to induce neurogenetic diseases. Uh, these studies have been published in toxicology report and toxicology uh, research. In addition to this, we also have chemical induced carcinogenesis. Um, there are some chemicals in the environment that can induce um, cancer. Um, this is actually an ongoing study being carried out by Judith Madu in the laboratory. Um, we expose flies to um, and methyl nitrosylurea separately and another set of flies to benzoyparin separately we check under the microscope on a daily basis the certain micros on daily basis the single ter the single treatment exposure of this um, each of these did not induce any morphological change but when we combine the two in the diet we found that as after some days the highs of some of the flies develop something like this that you can see in B and C compared with the control. And then this is what is now being carried out to be able to look at the genes, the cancer genes that are affected, and to be able to look at some other molecular markers. 
Apart from that also, um, we have just published this paper um, in Journal of Basic and Clinical Physiology and Pharmacology using sodium arsenide, which is a class one carcinogen. And then it disrupts antioxidant and radio homeostasis. And you know, once this happens, it can predispose to different diseases, not just cancer. We also have this, because of the time, I will not show all the detailed data there because my time is almost um, gone. Um, benzoyparin and the metabolites, and we published this in toxicology report. We have this ongoing project, like I mentioned earlier, the data that we use as preliminary data to apply for IGEP funding for three years, this is the third year, and we are actually using um, genetically modified models of Parkinson's disease, the Parkin, Pink one, and alpha sanocline. And then we want to understand the molecular target of resveratrol to be able to see if it will be able to rescue the flies. And I can assure you that um, we have interesting um, results. Um, in conclusion, there, has, uh, there is a strong correlation of toxicity between the fly and the mammals. Um, the only thing we should take note of is the fact that there are some, there may be some differences with respect to some chemicals that may induce toxicity in the fly and not in human. So we should just take that into consideration. And sometimes you can, you may need to carry out a pilot study to be able to see if the fly can metabolize the toxicant of interest. Nonetheless, the use of flies in toxicology should be encouraged because this will enable us to determine common pathways of a given drug um, or toxic agent in the in man and as well as in um, the fly. So I'd like to share a bit of our Christophila training initiative in Nigeria. So I'll just make it very brief from 2014 to 2021. Um, the impact of those Africa is, um, cannot be overemphasized because I returned from Brazil with two vials of flies and these two vials of flies are translated to Dosophila laboratories in Nigeria, as well as the Dosophila Research and Training Center. I remember when those Africa visited Nigeria in 2017. No, before 2017, they visited. I was I turned my office to a lab. It became a Dosophila lab, and this is our laboratory that we are currently using. And about 15 institutions in Nigeria, staff and students have visited us that have been trained. Some stay with us for up to a month, two months, three months, a week. And we have several of them that have actually started using the fly as a model in their institutions. And some have started at, um, um, getting grants. This is just a brief picture. I know that Dr. Lola, Dr. Isabel, Professor Kega, we um, be able to relate well with this. About 30 participants selected for Nigeria, Ghana, Rwanda for two week intensive dosophila research in our laboratory. University of Ibadan, eight seasoned scientists from different countries visited. And then this workshop was what actually opened up the Nigerian Dosophila um, research community. And it also brought a lot of um, demand on us. Um, for example, in 2017 and 2018, I visited the University of Jos um, to facilitate the Dosophila workshop. I also visited um, Federal University of Technology, Akure. I visited Obafemi Aula University with I two participants. And due to the demand of the demand for training by scientists, apart from that, also we also have several um, scientists that have been trained in our laboratory. Um, we set up the Sophila Research and Training Center, which is fully registered. And then we have some of the people we have trained that are manning this place. The place is opened every day, and then and that reduced the body. And just last year, together with um, Dr. Alex and Dr. Professor Andreas and um, Ma, 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 uh, what's her name? Mariana. We Mariana. Uh, facilitated, yes, thank you. Facilitated the Sophila workshop at Bia University. The first workshop facilitated by DRTC with another institution. And we had about 60 participants. And then last year, we visited four second, two secondary schools and two primary schools, and this year we visited 10 secondary schools with the Dosophila message to be able to catch them young. Uh, we were happy to receive small funding from Flybase as well as um, GSA to be able to visit the 10 schools to expose them to the fly early enough, and the response was amazing. Just this August, September, we had a summer Dosophila 
research training for people to just come at a particular time of their interest. And some of the participants are currently in this um, conference. The time we fail me to mention each of these funders one after the other for the support we have received over the years. Um, I cannot thank IGED enough for the three year funding that we are currently using that we have used to buy our return PCR as well as other equipment. I also thank um, Cambridge Africa Abrada. We were able to buy nano drop. We were also able to buy um, um, Thermocycler, brand new Thermocycler, jet documentation, as well as Transblood system. So I also thank EMBAs for labs. Um, Dr. Isabel know these people very well. They actually donated equipment to our research center. Several people that I cannot thank enough for all the support over the years. I also listed the students that have been privileged to supervise that we have worked together over the years to be able to achieve what we have been able to achieve. Some of them are about to defend the PAD, and one of them has just traveled again to Brazil, Adeola, for a PhD work. I want to thank all the people that we work together on the team of the Sofila Research and Training Center. I cannot mention them after the other. I thank the International Advisory Board members, Dr. Isabel, Professor Kagan, they are part of the team um, advisory board member for the support, for the advice, anytime. I also thank uh, the collaborators, Dr. Badmos and um, Mariana and several other people. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope I have not overshot my time. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Amos. Great talk. Thank you. Wonderful. So there are already a couple of questions for you. So I'm going to read one of them. Or maybe Edward, you can read it yourself. Uh, Edward Jenner Tetevi. Um, let me unmute you. There you go. So you can ask it. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Good morning, afternoon, and evening. Um, many thanks for your talk. Um, Dr. Emos, and uh, I would just like to know if you are happy to share some of your working protocols, especially with um, those who are new to Dosophilia. I mean, those of us who are just entering the world of the fly, if you could share protocols and probably um, some guiding principles in working with the fly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. Yes, we are happy to share. Um, some of the protocols that we validated, we have documented them, we'll be happy to share. Like Dr. Isabel say, uh, said, um, the Dosophila community share a lot of things, we share a lot of things. So I'll be happy to um, share any of the materials that, um, any of the protocol with you. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you. So I see two uh, raised hands. So Ross, you have a question? Sure. Uh, Amos, that was amazing. I'm always impressed by your work. So thanks for this. Um, so, so my question is, um, I realized that my real question was so complicated, I'm gonna boil it down. <laughs> it was just pretty usual for me. So you really showed beautifully, um, Rotenone, which is a cellular stress, oxidative stress, um, and you can get Parkinson's-like diseases. Also, um, high sugar diet, you're getting um, aspects of cell stress, and now you're digging into resveratrol. What do you think resveratrol is doing? Have you tried to put it together with things other than high sugar diet, high fat diet, things like that? Basically, what do you think resveratrol is doing in the system? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, based on the study that we have carried out over the years, um, which I will be happy to share the data with you, um, resveratrol actually reduces oxidative stress burden. Looking at the oxidative stress markers, we found that resveratrol reduces oxidative stress burden by, for example, oxidative stress markers, by lowering oxidative stress markers, and also by ensuring that the antioxidant enzymes are also restored. And you know, um, if oxidative stress is implicated, um, there are several diseases that can actually develop as a result of that. 
So we are interested in um, any, any drug or phytochemical that can help to reduce oxidative stress body. And this can help to actually um, maybe prevent some diseases or to also extend the lifespan of the organism if the organism is actually taking resveratrol. It's a, it's a rich antioxidative agent based on our findings. Great. So I would like to ask Anastasia from Ghana to ask your question. And that will be the last question, then we move to the next speaker. All the other questions can be answered in this slide. Thank you very much, Dr. Abolaji. Um, I just wanted to find out these chemicals, I mean, as you rightly said, some of them are carcinogenic, some of them are implicated in other diseases. Um, I, like how is the how are you able to safely dispose them or I mean like do they are used not cause any problems to the environment and I mean the other scientists using them? Okay, thank you very much. We take precautionary measures while using these chemicals, and then some of these chemicals are actually in the environment already. So we try as much as possible to ensure that um, whoever is using the chemical in the environment. Um, use it with precaution. Then also, we do not um, dispose them into the environment um, once we have used them, just directly anywhere. We carefully ensure that they are well um, disposed to prevent them from getting into the water bodies. And also, the amount that is mixed with the diet is so minute because the flies are so small. And then, as much as possible, we um, take precautionary measures. But these are also present in the environment. For example, if you look at um, some of these pesticides that we do, some of these insecticides, fungicides, they are already in the environment mixed with the food that we eat. We also have some of these metals that mercury in the water body as a result of waste from different industries. So they are already in the environment and we have several diseases that um, it's possible that the cause might be due to exposure to some of these chemicals. If you look at carpet, for example, part of the byproducts in the manufacture of carpet and tire is for vinyl cyclohexane that I just mentioned. So as a toxicology, we study the toxicity of these chemicals in order to be able to make public awareness to people to be careful by, uh, to ensure that they don't get exposed to these chemicals um, just anyhow, we have several of them with preservatives, paint that are used in the environment, even this ceiling. What is used for uh, this? What is used for ceiling in some countries? Um, asbestos has been banned in several countries. Obviously, there are some countries that are still using this asbestos, and it has been implicated to actually cause cancer. So, some of these chemicals are in the environment, and as toxicologists, we work on them, understand their mechanism of toxicity and we make the public to be aware of the risk of exposure to them. Thank you very much.